This is Where We Live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Water is essential in our lives, but it's also easy to take it for granted in the developed world. When we need water, we just turn on the tap. No need to boil it or walk miles just to get clean water. But with climate change, should we be concerned with how we use water? Coming up, we'll talk with Charles Fishman. He's an investigative reporter and author of The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water. He says over the next two decades, we'll need to reassess our relationship with water. Coming up, we'll talk with him. We'll also chat with the Hartford Current's environment and agriculture reporter, Greg Ladke, about water issues in our state, from anti-pollution standards to water infrastructure. And we'll get an update on where Connecticut's water plan stands. We'll hear from one of the people working on the plan, Alicia Sharmet from the Connecticut River Conservancy. First, you know what POTUS means, but how about WOTUS? For an explanation, joining us from the studios at NPR in Washington, D.C., is David Schultz, a reporter who covers water issues at Bloomberg Environment. David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So the acronym is Awkward WOTUS. Uh, Tell us what it stands for and why this rule came to be. Yeah, it it sure is. Uh, WOTUS stands for Waters of the United States, and it's uh, the way that the EPA uh, and the federal government determines whether a body of water is regulated by the federal government or not. So if a water is WOTUS, uh, then it is a federal water. If it's not, it's regulated by the states or maybe not at all. And it it came about uh, through the Clean Water Act, which was uh, passed all the way back in 19, uh, I think, 72. It was sometime in the early 70s. So tell us why it was necessary uh, to have this additional rule, because you mentioned the Clean Water Act, uh, and uh, many of our listeners know that that helped really uh, improve water quality in our country, also uh, brought back uh, many species that were on the brink of extinction. But let's talk about why this rule was needed. Yeah, that's a great point. It was one of the most successful environmental laws uh, from that that era, and there were a lot passed. But one of the failings uh, of that law was that it didn't really define what a water body was very well. It was very vague. And uh, so the EPA, uh, about 10 years after it was passed in, in the 80s, deter- you know, came up with a criteria that said, here's how we're going to determine what a water body is. Oceans, rivers, lakes, we need to, to figure this out. Uh, 20 years after that, uh, in the mid to late 2000s, the Supreme Court said, no, that's not uh, going to be acceptable your definition is too arbitrary, you're going to have to come up with a new one. Uh, So then the EPA said, okay, uh, you know, let's get started. It took them a long time. This is a very thorny legal issue. And eventually in 2015, the Obama uh, Obama administration came up with its WOTUS rule, uh, which uh, redefined which bodies of water were federally protected. And that's the rule that has caused so much controversy and that we're all still arguing about today. So tell us about the the waterways uh, that are now included under uh, WOTUS and why it has a certain uh, industry and other factions upset, and that's why it's ended up in court. Yeah. Uh, so it might be best to start off big and then go small. Uh, the Long Island Sound, for example, obviously that's a WOTUS. No one is arguing that's not. Uh, the Mystic River, um, that would also certainly be a WOTUS. I think a good rule of thumb is... Uh, if a wa- if you can sail a boat through a body of water, it is a water of the United States. Where it gets tricky is what about the streams and creeks that feed the Mystic River or the other you know innumerable rivers in the U.S. What about wetlands where it's just sort of a shallow pool of water uh, that may or may not have any connection to a lake or a river? What about a river that only flows, let's say. Uh, it's during this time of year, during the spring, what about, uh, uh, you know, any any other kind of river that you can't necessarily sail a boat through, but, you know, is flowing at some point in the year? Uh, that's where the issue really ha- has come to a head in that the Obama administration included a lot of those rivers as WOTUS, which means that they are federally protected, which means that if you want to uh, dump pollution in those rivers, you need a federal permit, which can be very expensive. The uh, A lot of business groups were furious by this, especially agriculture groups, farmers, who were worried that, you know, drainage ditches that they uh, dug on their own land would now all of a sudden require a federal anti-pollution permit. They filed a lawsuit against the, uh, they actually filed lots and lots of lawsuits against the Obama administration's rule, 
and uh, it just kind of got very complicated in court, and uh, it's still uh, ongoing. A lot of those lawsuits have not yet been resolved. Uh, when we think about some of the waterways under uh, WOTUS, ephemeral streams, certain types of wetlands, uh, these are uh, waterways or water bodies where uh, certain industry like mining, uh, they can have a real impact on the quality of water. Yeah, that that's right. And, and this is especially an issue in the West uh, where uh, there are a lot of water bodies that really only flow uh, maybe in the hours after a big rainstorm. I can say I actually... Uh, grew up in southern Arizona, and I can say there are a lot of those out there where it's a dry riverbed, but then after a storm, it's flowing. And is that a a water of the United States? If it's not, that means that, for example, you mentioned mining, uh, other kinds of industry, they can pretty much uh, dump, you know, with some exceptions, they can pretty much dump any kind of effluent in that stream uh, as much as they want without regulation. Now, there is an exception to that, which is that sometimes if a water is body is not a federal water body, it might be regulated by the state instead. And I think that's what the Trump administration is saying, is that if we withdraw uh, protections from some of these water bodies, states can then step in and, and regulate them as they see fit. Uh, we'll be talking about that uh, coming up uh, with a reporter here in Connecticut uh, with the regulatory burden that falls on states, states that don't have a lot of resources to be uh, looking out for pollution standards. But uh, on the phone with me, or I'm rather, uh, from uh, NPR studios in Washington, D.C., is David Schultz. Uh, he's a reporter for Bloomberg uh, who covers water issues uh, for Bloomberg Environment. As we look at uh, what's going to happen with this Obama-era water pollution policy known as WOTUS or the Clean Water rule. Uh, where does the Trump administration stand on this, David? Yeah, so the, uh, even before the uh, Trump was elected, he himself uh, vowed to repeal this and replace it with something that's much more narrow. Um, and that has not happened yet. This is a very, very difficult legal issue, uh, as evidenced by the fact that the 2015 rule is still being worked through in the courts. Uh, the Trump administration is still working on finalizing a repeal of the 2015 rule and uh, replacement. Uh, the uh, administrator of the EPA, Andrew Wheeler, told me recently that uh, they hope to have that finished by the end of this year. But in the meantime, uh, we have a really strange situation where the the business groups who filed uh, lawsuits against the 2015 rule uh, were successful in some courts and not successful in other courts, which means that the 2015 rule is in effect in some states, including Connecticut, uh, but is not in effect in almost uh, actually more than half of the other states. So we have really a half and half situation where there's different regulations being applied in in different states. Uh, Once the Trump administration uh, repeals and replaces uh, the 2015 rule, that will Uh, That could uh, solve the problem, but it it could bring up a host of other problems as well. When we uh, compare uh, the two administrations, uh, the Obama administration and now the Trump administration, when we think about uh, whether, uh, you know, under the Trump administration, does the EPA see clean water as a priority? And is that different in terms of drinking water uh, versus uh, preserving wetlands and how that's different from what uh, the Obama administration had put forth? Uh, Definitely stark differences uh, when we think about drinking water? Well, it's, it's very interesting because uh, when it comes to water pollution and regulating rivers and lakes, uh, certainly the Trump administration differs pretty widely from the Obama administration uh, as is evidenced by this WOTUS rule. They believe that the federal government should ha- play a much smaller role in regulating uh, waterways. When it comes to drinking water, though, there's actually a lot of similarities. I think both the Trump administration and the Obama administration have actually really struggled in a lot of the same ways to regulate the, the water that comes out of your tap. Um, it's a very, very difficult, uh, very costly thing to do. Uh, and the best evidence of that is the EPA's regulations on lead in water. We all know about uh, what happened in Flint, Michigan uh, with lead. The Obama administration worked for many years to try to Uh, update its lead regulations. And even after Flint was not able to do it, uh, the Trump administration is still working on that and still has not been able to propose new, stronger regulations on lead and water. So I think both uh, the Trump and his predecessor have really struggled in a lot of the same ways on drinking water. 
Uh, David Schultz, again, is a reporter for Bloomberg Environment. Uh, He covers water issues. David, um, in the weeks and months ahead, what will you be watching for? How these suits uh, play out in court? Yeah, I think right now we've reached a little bit of an equilibrium uh, when it comes to the lawsuits over WOTUS in particular. Uh, And there, again, there are a lot of them. Uh, As I mentioned, uh, Andrew Wheeler, the head of the EPA, said they could uh, finalize the repeal and the replacement of WOTUS uh, any day now. If and when that does happen, uh, I expect on the day that it is repealed and replaced, there will be a maelstrom of lawsuits from uh, environmental groups, from states uh, who sort of lean uh, democratic, that will be seeking to uh, try to to overturn the whatever the Trump administration does. And there's an interesting timing aspect here because if the Trump administration doesn't finalize its its repeal and replacement of WOTUS soon, it might not resolve all these legal issues uh, before the end of Trump's first term, because these take a long time to work their way through the courts. So if Trump is not reelected, there's a chance that we could start all over again and have this all wiped out under a Democratic president. Uh, So there's a strong motivation for them to get this done as quickly as possible so they can resolve the legal issues before uh, the, the first term of the Trump administration ends. David Schultz, again, reporter who covers water issues at Bloomberg Environment, joining us today from NPR Studios in Washington. David, thank you. Thank you. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up, we're going to now gonna get perspective on water issues here in Connecticut with Greg Ladke. He's the uh, environment and agriculture reporter for the Hartford Current. We're also going to talk with author Charles Fishman, who wrote the book The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water. And you can join our conversation, too, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We just heard how a new rule under the Trump administration will affect how federal and local governments protect our nation's water from pollution. Now, how will this impact Connecticut? Joining us to answer that question and give us some more perspective on water issues in our state, uh, Greg Ladke is in the studio with me. He's environment and agriculture reporter for the Hartford Current. Greg, welcome back. Nice to be with you. So we were uh, hearing about the Waters of the U.S. rule, the acronym WOTUS, or the Clean Water Rule. Um, our guest uh, from Bloomberg, Bloomberg said that uh, this will be playing out in courts for some time. Uh, how will this impact Connecticut uh, in terms of if it is fully uh, repealed? The problem for Connecticut is that uh, our environmental agency, which is the Energy and Environmental, environmental Protection Department, um, has been cut back so often and for so long because of all of our budget problems um, that they're understaffed and they're underfunded. And if you cut back uh, in, on federal regulation of almost anything to do with the environment, but water is a big part of that, it places an additional burden on an agency that is already sort of over its head. When we compare Connecticut with other states in terms of the standards in place, uh, fairly robust? Yes. Connecticut has some some of the toughest environmental um, water regulations uh, <clears throat> we're a model in some senses for other states. Uh, but the problems with water is that you can't restrict them. They cross state lines. For example, I've been writing a number of stories about pollution coming down from Massachusetts, from Holyoke and Springfield, flowing down the Connecticut River and eventually into Long Island Sound. There's just been some uh, agreements in the last couple of years where uh, these sewage treatment plant systems in those cities in Massachusetts have agreed to stop some of the sewage overflows that happens in big storms. So, uh, but, so Connecticut has been doing that for some time. The issue now is there's, and they've been saying to the federal government, make Massachusetts do what we have to do. So you have, you have all these different connected issues uh, whenever you talk about water. 
Again, uh, you were talking about water with uh, Greg Ladke, environment and agriculture reporter for the Hartford Current. You can join our conversation, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at where we live. Uh, earlier, uh, Greg, you mentioned that the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, known as DEEP in the state of Connecticut, um, uh, under-resourced. Uh, there have been cuts. So give us an idea when we think about some of the rules that we have or laws in place that are there should be oversight within DEEP, and then what's the actual enforcement? Can you give us some examples? whether it's pesticide use or... Pesticides is a very good one. Um, <clears throat> the uh, state has a law that says you have to, uh, uh, if you're a commercial pesticide user, you have to register with the state and file annual reports about what you're using and how much of it. Um, the problem with that is it's a paper system and the these reports are sent into deep and they're file, put in dusty file cabinets, and there's not enough staff to look at them. So no one really knows how much pesticide, pesticide of any particular type is going into the environment in Connecticut. And when you think about that, the biggest agricultural crop in Connecticut right now is lawn grass, and how much pesticide, herbicide, is being used on people's lawns, on industrial complexes' lawns, uh, so it's, it becomes a big issue. And in fact, there's legislation now before the General Assembly um, that would require all the money from these pesticide regulations to be put in a special fund to be used for more staff, to computerize these records so that somebody can actually look at them. Uh, and when you think about pesticide, a lot of people don't necessarily relate that to water. But if you put too much down on the ground, you get a rainstorm, it flows into the nearby streams, it ends up in the rivers, and it, ha it can have a very big effect on, on our uh, environment. So growth of algae, uh, lack of oxygen? Yeah. The, uh, <clears throat> one of the th big problems in Long Island Sound is that uh, th there's a lot of nitrogen uh, going in, particularly from sewage, that gets into the river, goes mm -hmm. down through all the, uh, not only the Connecticut River, but the, Tam the Thames and the Housatonic and other streams. And it flows into Long Island Sound. It acts as food for algae. You have these huge blooms, and when the algae dies, they sink to the bottom of the Long Island Sound, and there are these huge dead zones where there's not enough oxygen in the water to support any marine life. Uh, and so reducing the amount of nitrogen going into our uh, water system has become a major environmental topic and, and a big push. This is where we live. Today we're focusing on water. It's a vital resource, but in the developed world, it's easy to take uh, our, our access to clean water for granted. Uh, my next guest says we need to change our habits, and soon uh, joining us uh, is Charles Fishman, journalist and author of The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water. He recently wrote an essay for Pew called The Rediscovery of Water. Charles, welcome to our show. Good morning. So tell us I a little wanna, bit. I want to say, I want to say, I live in, in the outskirts of the city of Washington, D.C. We have a little creek flowing through our backyards. And because we are in D.C., that creek is waters of the United States. <laughs> I have custody of, of whatever, 90 feet <laughs> of waters of the United States. And, and we've actually had um, the, the Army Corps out to look at people building nearby to make sure they that that creek has the same protection as the Missouri River or the Mississippi River. Mm. It's very entertaining. <laughs> I mentioned that you're a journalist. Uh, when did you decide to focus on water? I know you wrote this book several years ago. And what have you found about how our relationship has changed, Charles? Well, I mean, I've been I've been writing about water for 10 years. And and I think what's interesting is that the first two reporters focused um, are talking specifically about pollution and what's in our water now. And, and we do need to think about going forward, all those rules need to be modernized. And I, and I, the, the waters of the United States rule is controversial in part because it asks communities like farmers to change their standards and change their practices, but it doesn't really account for who's going to pay for that. And so... If you take a step back and you look at the Clean Water Act in 1972, every body of water in the United States right now in 2019 is, is cleaner than it was uh, 45 years ago when the Clean Water Act was passed 47 years ago. That's a remarkable accomplishment. Um, we shouldn't be fighting about what kind of water we want 
and we should we, we have enough resources we should be able to have a reasonable conversation about how to get the rules paid for who's going to incur the cost and 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 in the case of farmers if we want them to behave differently we need to really help them behave differently um, so that because what they do has a has a wide impact, but we can't ask them to shoulder all that burden. And and so I think it's important to say we've made enormous progress. And 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 I think probably if you sat down at a table with with forty people who were involved in this, they would agree on what they want the water to look like at the end. And so really, what you end up needing to have a conversation about is how you get there. I think climate change is going to change the the sort of visibility of water dramatically. And that's kind of a different element of water, which is we the reason we take water for granted is that we've had literally 100 years of brilliant engineering where we haven't had to worry about it. In, we're talking about in the developed world. Our water is really unthinkingly safe. Uh, it's abundant. We, we don't ever turn on the tap and find it not there. And for most of us, from, from farmers to our own showers, it's essentially free. You call and that so the golden that, age of water? I, I call that is the golden age of water. And, and that's been great. But, but climate change is going to change all of that because that system assumes water arriving in certain places at certain times. It, it, it assumes the water will be there. It assumes it'll be rain or snow or tides or lakes. And climate change is going to change that. And the truth is our infrastructure is, we don't think of it this way, but it's built for a certain climate. And when the water moves, even if the water moves 200 miles, even if it starts falling 40% more is rain than is snow, that changes the entire landscape. Just in the last year or two, we've seen Houston overwhelmed with flooding. We've seen a town in the Florida panhandle wiped off the map by hurricane tides. We've seen a town in California burned to the ground by drought. Those, everything to do with climate change is a water impact. And we need to say, wait a minute, we may not have the infrastructure we need to deal with the future that's coming, and we need to <laughs> adapt quickly. Let me get Greg Ladke uh, back in on the conversation. Uh, he's the environment and agriculture reporter for the Hartford Current. Uh, we were hearing Charles Fishman talk about the impact of climate change, how it will impact our infrastructure here in Connecticut, um, thinking about m- many people who rely on uh, well water, also uh, many homes along the shoreline. Um, how How is the, the talk about infrastructure and trying to make sure that we're prepared uh, for these changes uh, coming in. Um, how's that being discussed, Greg? I think there's a lot of discussion, and people are only in the last couple of years, particularly along Long, the Long Island Sound shoreline, are beginning to realize how big an impact and how costly an impact this is going to be. Um, the, uh, for just examples of roads that would f- flood every once in a while are now flooding almost on a, a regular basis with every significant rainstorm or snow uh, uh, snow melt um, the uh, there's a huge issue in just the rail lines and highways along the shoreline um, with the rise of the sea levels in Long Island Sound and the increased presumably ferocity of the storms that are going to come ashore um, we could see major disruptions if uh, if these lines are flooded or washed out um, so Connecticut has, is, have, has a, a whole system of uh, consultants and academics working with towns, particularly along the shoreline, uh, to try and uh, get ready for this and change what needs to be changed, whether it's building up roads, raising them up, or uh, sewage treatment plants, which tend to be near water's body of water, uh, protecting them, um, micro uh, energy programs too. So if the power gets cut by these massive storms, you have something that will keep on going. Uh, I, I think that in this sense, government is a little bit ahead of the curve uh, compared to the average citizens. I don't think people really understand how Im- much they're going to be impacted by these more frequent storms, these changing as um, 
Mr. Fishman was talking about uh, the how these storms come and what they bring to us. Um, but with every major weather event that happens, whether it's here in Connecticut or across the U.S., uh, the public is coming around more and more because you, you can't you can't, it's, it's very hard to deny these things when they're happening and, and there are people dying. You can join our conversation here on Where We Live, 860-275-7266. As we focus in on water, Greg Gladkey, a reporter for the Hartford Current, and joining us from Clean Cuts in uh, Washington, D.C., is uh, Charles Fishman, investigative reporter and author of The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water. Uh, Charles, I wanted to pick up something that Greg had mentioned about um, getting people to understand uh, the impacts. Um, You have talked, and especially with all the research you've done with your book that came out several years ago, uh, most Americans don't even understand how water gets to their faucet and all of the different things that have to happen. Um, and that ignorance plays into the fact that we take uh, take it for granted that well, we've got this clean water. We don't have to boil it or, or walk many miles to, to get some to get some water to use. Well, sure. And, and that's I mean, look, people people are busy. They're 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 trying to do their jobs. They're trying to raise their kids. They're trying to occasionally have fun. And, and the fact that we don't have to think about our water is a sign of of how beautifully the system's been engineered. I think pe- people think about what what ends up intruding on their life or looks like a problem. And, and the point Greg made is really important. Connecticut wouldn't have built the rail lines and the roads and highways that are along the coast the way they're built now in the climate that exists now. And, and that's true in Charleston, South Carolina. It's true in Miami Beach, Florida. And so, so the truth is we don't, we don't understand the water system because we haven't had to. Mm-hmm. What's happening now is nature is, is showing us that the future is going to look a little different. And I think the good news is for most Americans, one of the things they don't have to pay attention to is their water bill. Water bills tend to be very modest. The typical bill for the actual water that comes into your house, not the wastewater treatment, but the clean, fresh water, is is between thirty and forty dollars a month, a buck a day for all the water you need. That's it costs you less for all the water you use in your house than if you walked into a convenience store and bought a single half liter of of Poland Spring or, or Fiji water. That's kind of amazing. If every American family paid for water only what they pay for one monthly iPhone subscription, for one of the two or three or four that every family has, there'd be more than enough money to start solving water problems. And so people, we we not only don't pay that much attention to it, and we sort of have a a blind spot. I, I, I call it water illiteracy. We don't actually know that much about it. But we think water should be cheap. And the truth is, if our water cost seventy-five or eighty dollars a month instead of thirty dollars a month, we could use that money to pay for the things that urgently need attention. And and water problems don't get better. If you if you see a wet spot in the in the living room, you don't say, "Honey, look, it seems like the roof is leaking. Why don't we wait a couple months and see what happens? Maybe it'll fix itself." No water problems fix themselves, but but we have more than enough resources to fix the problems, and and the truth is, given what we pay for other things, it won't even be that expensive, but it will get more expensive the longer we wait. Just like the damage from the from the leak in your roof gets more expensive the longer you wait. Greg Lackey. Yeah, I was uh, thinking that. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. Over the last couple of years, we'd had a dr- very severe drought in Connecticut. And there was a big controversy because uh, the, uh, wa- the water company, the private, a public-private uh, operation that provides water for the Hartford area, uh, made an agreement with a big water bottling company to give them tens of thousands of gallons of water every day, and it caused a furor for uh, people who were looking at uh, the drought conditions for two, two and a half years here. Uh, I think that may have been the first time that people in the Hartford region really thought about where their water was coming from and whose water it, who 
does that water belong to? And that's another issue in the in the legislature right uh, now. We got an email from Terry uh, who writes, when we've experienced droughts, we're put on a strict water regimen. I don't like to be selfish, but the out-of-state companies which plan to export our water are not concerned about our water needs. Uh, Charles Fishman, uh, when we think about private companies, uh, they have the ability to innovate and uh, technology uh, to help uh, make our plants more efficient. But then there's also the, the challenge, the tension of not allowing our public resource to be in control uh, by private companies. Uh, what's your take on that? My take is what you just said. The, the truth is that, that water is a public resource and um, and no company ends up in control of water or managing water in a way that the people in that community don't like without some government giving them permission, giving them the latitude to do it. So I think private companies have incredible uh, energy around water issues. Greg Ladke said government is a little bit ahead of the public in terms of tackling adaptation to climate change. Corporations are 10 years ahead of government because water hits them where they live. There's lots of innovation going on at places like Coca-Cola and Ford Motors and Google. Google just started using recycled water in Atlanta to cool all their server uh, farms. And, and they're the first organization in Atlanta to ever use uh, cleaned wastewater f for, a, you know, for a, a purpose like that. But water needs to be maintained in the sort of custody and the management of governments. And that's, that's not hard. When, when, it, when it goes off the rails, when it goes astray, it's because the regulators haven't done a good enough job. Corporations will take whatever running room they can get if they're given, you know, if they're given uh, uh, responsibility for municipal water, water systems and so forth. We, we, we actually have the power to control how water is managed. And, and I think there's, there's, there are waves of innovation in the private sector that, that will really help uh, governments and communities adapt smartly. Uh, Charles, uh, Charles, before we head to break, uh, could we get into um, the way uh, our habits around water usage, where even uh, when we think about how our water um, is treated and, and purified, but the ways that we're uh, wasting water, misusing water, so to speak, uh, when we could be using like potable water uh, in terms of flushing our toilets? Yeah, I mean, look, the, you, can't, you can't go through and rip out a, 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 a 50 year old plumbing system in in Connecticut that's been there you know and is well planted but you can think about the future my, my favorite example is Orlando Florida in 1985 the, the folks in Orlando looked at the growth curves for the city and the water availability growth going up water availability not moving at all and they they passed laws the laws said all new construction in Florida, has to use recycled water for all outdoor uses. And then they built a recycling plant. And that, and everybody who existed in Orlando and Central Florida was grandfathered at that moment. That didn't help them in 1986 or 1989. But now, 35 years later, Orlando uses exactly as much water as it used in 1985, and the community has doubled in size twice the number of people using as much water as half the number of people used to, and, and all of that outdoor water use uses recycled water. So you, you have to think ahead. You have to imagine where you're going to be 10 years from now, and you have to have some confidence. You have to say, we're, gonna, we're not going to change everybody's habit by July or by a year from November. We're going we're gonna to look at what we want to accomplish 10 years from now, and we're going to have to get there a few steps at a time. And it is absolutely possible to do it, and there are good examples. You can't just flick a switch with people's water use, but over the course of a decade, you can literally change how, how everybody does everything. I like the example uh, of Las Vegas that you have talked about, um, where they're incentivized to zero scape, to not have lawns. Uh, uh, money talks, right? Right. I mean, L Las Vegas kind of has this b brilliant, slightly counterintuitive, but 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 really smart program. People moved to Las Vegas. Las Vegas went from being a city of 
30,000 people to be in a city of two and a half million people. And all those people came from parts of the United States where they had lawns. And, and so they grew lawns in the desert. And the, the, the irrigation of lawns in Las Vegas was literally the equivalent of farm irrigation to grow crops. Many, many inches of water for every square foot of lawn in Las Vegas. Because, of course, you, you shouldn't be growing green grass in the desert. And so Las Vegas started a campaign. They, they actually paid you $40,000 an acre to take your lawn out. The, the money had to go to replacing the lawn with desert landscaping, what's called xeriscaping. So if you had a half acre um, of lawn on your house, uh, you, you got paid $20,000 if you literally hired somebody to take the lawn out and replace it. And by doing that, they, they actually managed to cut uh, water use across the city by about 25% just from that program. By the way, just like Orlando, as they did that, they passed rules outlawing front lawns in new homes in Las Vegas. If you have built a home in Las Vegas in the last 15 years, you don't get to have grass in your front lawn because grass doesn't make any sense and it, and it hurts the community. And so they're, they're gradually moving their subdivisions so that they look like people who live in the desert while allowing growth that doesn't suck up water that is really precious out there, changing habits a little bit slowly. Charles Fishman is a journalist and author of The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water, joining us today from Clean Cuts in Washington, D.C. Also in studio with me here on Where We Live, Greg Ladke, environment and agriculture reporter for the Hartford Current. We're going to continue our conversation after the break. We're going to hear from the River Steward uh, for Connecticut. And you can join us, too. Uh, find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live or give us a call, 860-275-7266. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Are you worried about the future of water in our state? What steps have you taken to change your habits or conserve water? You can join our conversation, 860-275-7266, or find us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, at where we live. Uh, Jack's calling from Hartford. Jack, go ahead. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, Hi, I'm Jack Hale. I'm chair of the Tree Advisory Commission here in Hartford, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things that relate to this conversation. One, particularly uh, climate change. Uh, we're seeing the extreme weather in the city causing major impact on uh, the tree canopy in the city. And the tree canopy is critical to uh, water quality. Uh, the major uh, value of our trees is stormwater retention. It keeps water out of our sewer system, and our overflowing sewer system is uh, the source of a lot of our river pollution, a good part of it. We see sewer overflows here in Hartford, in particular at the sewage treatment plant in the South Meadows, that directly affect uh, that water quality. Uh, But the, the drought and extreme weather we've had in the last few years has caused a lot of our trees to die. Uh, we, Jack, we're, we're, Jack, we're short on time. Do you have a, a, another question or comment that you would like Greg Ladke from The Current to respond to? Uh, not necessarily <laughs> response. I just want to let people know that it's critical to plant trees, and individuals can do that. Uh, it doesn't re- have to rely on government. It's not a regulatory thing. Uh, and we can all have an effect. And when the MDC is trying to reduce the s- stormwater overflowing, they ought to be planting lots of trees as well. Thank you, Jack, for your call. I, that's a good point that you raised. Uh, let's talk about quickly the MDC uh, stormwater uh, project. What's happening uh, in this area, Greg? And I'm just curious what your thoughts are on as what Jack had mentioned, too. Well, one, one of the biggest things is a multi-hundred million dollar program uh, that is going on right now. They're digging a gigantic tunnel uh, underneath Hartford. And the idea is that when you have these major storms and you have this rush of water that, uh, that the sewage treatment plant can't handle, they would pipe it into this giant tunnel once it's done. And uh, then after the storm, when the sewage plant isn't overwhelmed, bit by bit, they could uh, 
process it and, and put it back into the, uh, the w- water stream. Um, it is a huge project. It's, uh, it's like uh, digging uh, the channel under the English Channel. We got a comment on Facebook about this uh, 40-year plan to spend over $2 billion to reduce sewage-contaminated stormwater through the MDC. Uh, but Anthony writes, there's almost uh, zero green infrastructure to reduce runoff in the first place. Yeah, I was talking with Jack Hale about this uh, not too long ago, and he was, he was saying that, that uh, the MDC p- people don't seem to really have a, a focus on green infrastructure. Their attitude is, well, if we put in green infrastructure, um, then it becomes the city's problem, and the city has all these budget problems, they can't take care of it. But if you plant, a tree, plant trees in the right places, Mr. Hale will tell you, <laughs> that, uh, that you don't really need to take care of it. You get it, put it in somebody's yard. Um, it's, a, it's a remarkable... Uh, inexpensive, really, way to handle stormwater and uh, air, even air pollution. It contributes a lot of different things. We're talking about uh, water issues here in our uh, state on where we live. Uh, joining the conversation by phone now is Alicia Sharmut, uh, river steward for Connecticut at the Connecticut River Conservancy. Alicia, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, so tell us a little bit uh, first what the river steward is exactly, and then as we look to the future of water in our state, what are some uh, priorities that uh, citizens should be thinking about? Um, sure. So the Connecticut River Conservancy is a four-state organization that protects the Connecticut River and its watershed. Um, and as far as the state of Connecticut is concerned, um, you know, we, as people have mentioned before, with climate change on the horizon, and even, um, you know, the simple task of upgrading the existing infrastructure that ne- isn't necessarily at this time being influenced by, um, by climate change, um, we're, we're finding ourselves in a position where, you know, I think people in Connecticut are paying more attention because they are seeing their water bills go up and their wastewater bills go up. And, you know, if all of our pipes were above ground, um, a lot of these things would have been fixed a long time ago. But um, because of the age of our region, um, as far as our infrastructure goes, um, the the challenge of, you know, meeting conservation goals and um, uh, meeting the challenge of climate change becomes even, even more um, uh, money intensive, um, for sure. I, I know we've talked about the water plan on the show uh, previously. You were involved in helping uh, work on uh, the updated plan. Uh, what's the status of that, and, and what are some of the goals? So um, Connecticut is in a very fortunate position. We are creating a plan for our water in a time when we are not in crisis. Um, and we need a very solid decision-making process in order to make sure we have enough water for fish and faucet 50 years from now. And we have that decision-making process in some instances, and in others, it it is lacking. Um, A a good example of this and why the push for the state water plan came was the controversy over the MDC providing water to the University of Connecticut. Um, Many people said, wait a second, if just because they have it and they need it, why is this automatically a good idea? What's the decision-making process for how this happens? Um, And so... um, the state invested a million dollars in in getting, you know, a bunch of people in the room, independent experts, stakeholders, agencies to develop this plan for our water. And right now it sits with um, the four committees of cognizance in the legislature. Um, and we we need to see this thing get get passed, not only to, to we don't want to lose the million dollar investment, but we need to continue moving forward so that we can meet the challenges that um, – that Mr. Fishman was talking about other countries are finding themselves in. Uh, Greg Ladke, uh, you cover environment and agriculture for the Hartford Current. Uh, this water plan, uh, well, tell us a little bit more about um, whether there'll be movement this session. Is, is it on the minds of, of, of most of our uh, residents in the state? I don't think it is. I think it is in, on the minds of um, people who are directly affected by the uh, controversy surrounding the MDC, whether it was Yukon or the uh, Niagara Bottling Company uh, uh, issue. Uh, right now, it's in the legislature. One of the th- reasons it didn't pass last year was this: uh, that water companies, not only the MDC, but like the MDC, uh, were, were objecting to certain uh, statements that the 
water in, uh, that they're controlling, they're supposed to direct to people, uh, is a public trust. And I think they felt it was going to restrict them in, in handling things uh, like the Niagara Bottling Company deal, which provides the MDC with revenues and helps cover the cost of maintaining the system. On the other side of that coin is other uh, Connecticut residents were very worried that this bottling company would take water, and if we had another drought, what would happen then? So uh, I think it's probably I think the likelihood is it's going to pass through the General Assembly this year. Um, it came close last year, and these things tend to be incremental. So uh, I think you can look forward to uh, to that. The Lamont administration, I believe, is all in favor of it as well. Mm. We just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, uh, Alicia Sharman, again, River Steward for Connecticut at the Connecticut River Conservancy. Uh, we were talking about uh, the impact of climate change, uh, rising sea levels on our water systems. Also, when we think about the number of residents who rely on uh, their wells and what would happen with saltwater intrusion, uh, what would you say to uh, the residents who do depend on well water? Uh, should they be concerned? And what can be done? Well, I, at this time, um, you know, the, the private residents who rely on private well water um, are essentially responsible for ensuring that um, their own wells are, are in working order, that the water quality um, is good enough. And, you know, I think we need to have better protections for these private well owners, um, whether it be um, more... Um, more thought to the connection between our land use and private wells and how um, the, the use of our neighbors impact the wells because, you know, some of these, these well systems um, are connected, you know, over several properties. Um, and, and sometimes the state doesn't always have the, the, uh, the ability to come in and, and act as a regulator in, in these instances. And it's something we really need to look at to protect all Connecticut residents, um, or you know, find a way for our our residents with private wells to to you know take more responsibility to make sure their water is clean. Uh, Charles Fishman is still with us, uh, a journalist and author of The Big Thirst. Uh, uh, Charles, uh, before uh, we end the show, I mean, when we think about water again, not something we can take for granted. Uh, we there are uh, factors in play uh, that can change our usage. Uh, what are some uh, final thoughts uh, for our listeners uh, to think about when they think about this resource? You know, just the last few minutes, the discussion has been really interesting. First of all, planting trees not only helps keep water clean and helps with stormwater runoff, it is a key way of battling climate change. So planting trees is one of the least expensive, least complicated things you can do that not only helps water, it helps the future. It, it, it would really be indispensable to do that. And, and Greg Ladke alluded to the fact that, that Hartford's building this huge tunnel to help manage stormwater. We just did that in Washington. D.C. It cost us a billion dollars. But Washington, D.C. reduced the cost of the tunnel it had to build by having a companion program to install green infrastructure all around the city. They not only came in and put permeable pavement along the curbs so the water doesn't go in the storm drains, it goes back in the ground. They will come to your home and plant water gardens. We've had two water gardens installed on our property so that the water doesn't run off the grass and the driveway and into the storm drains. It goes back into the ground. Those programs are much, much cheaper than building pipes. And they last forever, and they put the water back into the natural water cycle the way it should be. And so if there are officials from Hartford or other municipalities listening, green infrastructure is modern. It is not hard. And it is a way of getting ready for the future that you can never build a big enough pipe. <laughs> well, thank you, Charles Fishman, for joining us. Again, author of The Big Thirst, The Secret Life and Turbulent Future of Water. Also with us today, Greg Ladke from the Hartford Current and Alicia Charmet, River Steward for Connecticut. Uh, today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Thanks to intern Griff Shaler on the phones. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. You can learn more about where we live at our website, wmpr.org. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Have a great weekend. <laughs>